And good evening and welcome to Beyond the Gardens Live. A special welcome if you've joined us for the first time. This program is perhaps unlike any other that you've watched on gardening. Firstly, it's live. Well, as long as it's the 9th of October at the moment. Um, secondly, it is based in Perth, nowhere else. Uh, thirdly, we're extremely biased towards local. And fourthly, we're not here to sell you products. There, just like that. The That's program right. is, however, made possible by sponsorship, and that sponsorship comes from the Ward Corporation, who in fact sponsor this program so that we can advise you not to buy their product. Isn't that rather nice? Okay, so what is the program all about? Well, you get in touch with us and we attempt to answer your questions. In the studio tonight, we have John McWilliams. Hello. Landscaper, irrigator, pretty busy bloke, as we'll find out <laughs> in a moment. And Gary Hetty is even busier, even though he's just had a little spell, an enforced spell in North Queensland. Bearable, was it, Gary? It was tough. Yeah. It was yeah, tough. Yeah, yeah. Really tough. You notice the difference between 32 and suddenly come back here. So. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. And uh, look, we are here to have a chat with you. Live, as the program is called, means you can get in touch with us right now. Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah, you can call us. 6468-5994. Please remember to turn your sound down uh, when you talk to us. There's a bit of a delay. Mm, one of those technical limitations, okay. Um, but we have other modern means of communication. And you can actually email us anytime on tv at begonyardgardens.com.au and don't forget, send us a photo because that makes life a lot easier for us. Yep. It's a great advantage of email, and we've got lots of those emails. What have you been up to during the week, by the way, John? Uh, busy, busy. <coughs> it's, the sun's come out, and everyone wants things done So they yesterday. feel like and gardening again, Yes, don't they? absolutely. Yeah. No, we've been um, doing some reticulation and uh, starting a, an interesting project uh, with some groups uh, in Perth. Uh, more on that in future weeks we to come. Yeah, um, mm. just waiting and for we know some... that Gary's been on hot yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. But he's paying for it now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> During the week, we have accumulated quite a few emails, uh, and we'll get to those in a moment. But first, we thought perhaps we might look at a problem of the week, because right at the moment, there is a problem brewing. This is what a healthy Agonis flexuosa nana looks like. But unfortunately, this is what many of them actually look like, all dried out, washed, bleached. They look like they're on death's door. They're tough plants, they might survive, but the trouble is we don't know what's causing the problem. Well, I can tell you, the cause is very small indeed, though often present in very large numbers. It is thrips. Athrips is a tiny fly, that's all it is, that rasps and sucks its way through the foliage, literally sucking the life out of the plant. But because it's so small, we don't see it, so we don't know what the cause is, and neither do we know how to treat it. Here's your simple test, if you suspect that thrips are around. Put a sheet of white paper underneath the plant, and then belt the plant quite vigorously, anything will do, in an attempt to dislodge the little beasties onto the white background, where you can see them quite easily. They might be black, or they might be immature brown ones. This is but one symptom of the problems that they cause. On other plants, their feeding activities result in curled or distorted new growth, and it can make a real mess on things like bottle brush. In that case, the best thing to do is simply to prune the effect growth off and destroy it, get a little bit of vengeance on the thrips. But with a plant like the Agonis flexuosa nana, it may well recover and make new growth if you can control the insect in the first place. You can use a systemic pill to put in the ground, It's worth looking out for thrips right now because they are they will build up even further as the warm weather comes and I say so small you've got to do that white paper test not just leaf thrips by the way we also get them on flowers so mm. roses get belted lots of plants get belted mm, by yeah. thrips so if you can't see anything chances are you need a magnifying glass yeah, absolutely so before we go to the emails give us a call the, the phone lines are open as they say six four six eight five double nine four and please remember to turn that sound down now, we did have a lot of emails coming during the week, so thanks to all of you who have done that. The first one here is from Stuart. Thanks very much, Stuart. Uh, Stuart has a number of rhubarb plants that grow in sandy soil. Uh, they have short stems during both winter and summer months. They produce good long stems during the spring months. 
He uses a general purpose fertilizer and chicken manure in pellet form. He's also used PVC pipe buried near the plant uh, to water deeply during the hot summer months. Has a little, uh, has helped a little bit to extend the harvesting period. Uh, and he knows that rhubarb is affected by the temperature. Uh, and, and we do have a picture of Stuart's rhubarb. Yes, he's rhubarb. attached to the photograph. Um, yeah, which is and there somewhere. If we can find it, there it is. generally yeah. asking for some tips to extend the harvesting period of rhubarb in Perth's sandy soils. Mm. Rhubarb's mm. one of those favourites, I think, and many, many yeah. people, uh, particularly because we have a lot of English migrants here where rhubarb is mm. a, yes. almost a staple part of the diet and dead easy to grow there, not so easy to grow here. Basically, rhubarb is a swamp dweller. Um, and that means it also likes acid soils. So it's a little bit uncomfortable in our mostly alkaline soils. Uh, if you can change the soil, however, by adding clay mm. prior to planting, that'll be terrific. Um, yes, feed them regularly. Yes, mulch. We'll probably pull the pants off you talking yes. about mulch, <laughs> but it's particularly important with those plants that need a lot of water to prevent that moisture yeah. loss from the surface. Absolutely. Um, and um, will they always be red? No. <laughs> No, exactly. Best thing to do with green rhubarb, it tastes just the same, is to buy some food colouring, red food colouring, cook it with that. Yeah. Nobody will ever know. <laughs> no, no, Nobody no. will ever know. Yeah, and, and the other thing too is just a reminder when you're ask, you know, asking us a question, just let us know what suburb you're in yeah. because he mentions a sandy soil, but that, if that's out on the coast, chicken manure is probably the worst thing you can possibly use because it's mm. alkaline yep. and we're looking for an acid just environment. Just compounding the problem. Yeah. So you could actually be making problems worse. Yep. Hmm. Your deep watering with the tube trick, yes, yeah. we all did that back in the 70s, but... No, you we don't do it anymore, no, do we? No, you basically no. put the water beyond the root zone and yeah. you're effectively wasting most of it. Yeah, yeah so deep um, watering, forget that philosophy because, it, quite simply, it doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Good, just a way to waste water. Yeah, okay, absolutely. next email. Let's build through yes, a few. Yes, OK. And, and uh, this one here chance. is from John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, what could I add to make my passion fruit sweet? And also, John would like to know when he can divide Dianellas. Mm, OK. Mm. Passion fruit first. What can he add? Sunshine? Uh, sunshine. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's really what makes fruit sweet. Yeah, it, it is. Basically, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, it, you know, the more sunshine you can get on the plant, then uh, the more sugars can be created in the foliage, the yep. more goes into the fruit. So, basically, what you need is basically have your um, passion fruit vine facing north. Um, if there's too many leaves, thin a few out to allow that sunshine into the passion fruit. And that goes for all your fruit trees. If we had Peter Coffin here, he'd be on and on and on about pruning in yep. summertime to get that light into the tree. So, yep. yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, that's basically the answer. Yeah. But there's nothing you can add. Uh, I, I have heard people recommend you add sugar to make passion fruit sweet. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and on top of that, forget about a lot of the other stories about all these specialist fertilisers yeah. and things. Yeah. That's just a pile of rock. I mean, they need fertiliser, but sunshine is yes, particularly important. absolutely. And the subject of dividing, dividing, uh, dividing Dianellas. Dianellas. Uh, any, uh, any time, time except probably in the height of summer. So, yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're all fairly clumpy. Yeah. Um, they do sulk a bit, a little bit. Mm. Mm. Um, hang on. Particularly let's see some if I of the, the a... new varieties, the, the cultivated varieties, yeah. tend yeah. to sulk yeah. a fair bit, uh, particularly the heavy eastern states um, influenced varieties. Yeah. So, so this is one of the modern varieties here. Um, you can see it's a clumpy sort of a beast yes. in this picture. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, spade, fump yep. down the middle. Straight through. Yep. And, and interesting enough, a lot of the dinellas are sulking a bit at the moment. They've got a bit of mould. Oh, they don't know what's going on. They it's... don't know what the season's all about. Too at the wet, moment. sunny, the next. And, yeah, um, so. So a little bit of maintenance, pull out all the old dead-looking ones, dead leaves, just rip them out of the, out of the socket. Yeah. And, and if you're wondering, sorry, why, yeah. they, why they named a plant after a suburb, it's, it's the, the other way around. Way around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Okay, uh, another email uh, uh, from Tim. Uh, what's the best fertiliser for a Kensington Pride mango? <coughs> uh, okay, Tim, nice and easy. As with all plants, a general purpose, slow release fertiliser. Indeed, with, with a trace elements. complete suite of trace elements. No and special fertiliser needed. And the application, you've got to start getting into the habit of fertilising beyond the drip zone. Yeah. You see all the time people showing you to fertilise around the base of the tree. There are no feeder roots there. It's all the actions further yeah. out. Yeah. And in my place, I often have to fertilise the lawn because that's where all the root system is. So I'm, I mow my lawn yeah. and allow the material to go back in and, and that 
why I keep the uh, nutrients in the soil yeah. ready for the fruit. There you go. Absolutely. And the mango's flowering at the moment. Mm. So uh, we were talking about pollination last week. Mangoes, look out for blowflies. Blow okay? If you smell a mango flower, you'll realise that <laughs> that's why blowflies prefer them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, no. <laughs> Fruit still tastes fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So thanks for those emails. Keep those emails coming in. We have a caller on the line, so thanks for that. If you have got a question that can't wait for an email, please call us 64685994. Good evening, caller. Are you there? Uh, yes, evening. I am. Hello. Welcome. How are you? Hello. We're well. We're well. Um, I have roses. Mm-hmm on the back and I've had them for about seven to nine years and they're just not thriving they keep on dying to, on me um, I have replaced them I don't know what's in the soil I have done manure I've uh, done a lot of things <laughs> nothing seems to be working can you uh, please oh, give look, me some advice uh, yes but this would be one of those queries where honestly we'd be much better off with a picture and even then, I'm oh. not sure that we could give you a positive answer. But I think, I think you're probably on the right, the caller's on the right money. It, it sounds like there's something in the ground. Uh, is it um, an old house or a new house? Um, we've been here about 35 years, 30 yeah, to 35 yeah. years. Uh, and I think it's where they've buried all the rubbish from the house. Yeah, the exactly, material. yeah, that, that was the reason behind the question. In the old <laughs> days, they used to bury all the stuff on site. That's right, yeah, And uh, they'd, they'd tip out... Levels. Sometimes they'd wash the walls yeah, the with acid to get the mortar off and they'd tip like that, that out as well. Um, so I suspect that's what's gone on, and honestly, I can't be sure of that. Yeah. So did what we, would you do? Did, did we get a suburb? That? Start again. Did we get a suburb? Where, where are I you want... living? I live in Willerton in Perth. Okay. okay. Um, in that, if, if you encountered that, yep. just dig the soil out. Sorry, again. I missed which suburb it Willison. was. Uh, Willison. Willison. Yeah. yeah, I'd be looking at, yeah, just replacing that soil. Uh, yeah, the top 30 that centimetres. Deep, top 30 um, centimetres. And, okay. yeah, just probably replace it. Uh, Willison soils are still sandy, aren't they? Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna <laughs> but, yep. again, uh, work on that 10 to 15% organic matter. Apply the clays uh, to keep them going through the warmer summer months. Yeah. Just, and just, and will grow much better. One other query. Are you using manures? Yes, I am. I've got a cow and sheep manure. Yep. Sometimes I give them blood and bone and sometimes liquid fertiliser. Now, you don't apply the fertiliser or the manure right up to the base of the plant, do you? No, I don't. Yeah, good. They're all clear, even when I mulch. No, I look, I, I don't think the fertilisers are going to make yes. up for the problem. And, yep. in fact, unfortunately, you may well be compounding the problem by creating a stronger solution in the ground. Uh, it's difficult to assess soil. You need a proper laboratory test, and uh, that's mm. usually expensive. Your cheapest uh, way out of it is actually to replace the soil. Uh, and good luck with it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, yes. Who yes. Uh, I, I, I hope our call is happy. Yes, um, we have a few more calls on the line. Okay, so, yeah, well, just well, remember, if you have got a question like that previous caller... Um, Send us a photo during the week uh, and we'll endeavour to get back to we'll it uh, in mm. the, for the following week. Meanwhile, let's open the garden gate again. Absolutely. Hello, welcome to the program. Are you sure there was somebody yeah. there? Good evening. Good evening. Oh, hello. Good evening. Yes, hello. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. A uh, couple of queries, if I may. Uh, do pitcher plants attract fruit, fruit fly? Uh, do pitcher plants attract fruit flies? Is that the question? Um, yes. I don't think they do. Um, well, are you looking... I don't think they'd be a meaningful um, are you method at, of control. Yeah, I was going to say, I, uh, either you're looking at them for control or you've got lots of pitcher plants and you seem to be getting a lot of fruit fly. No, I, I haven't got a lot, at the, any at the moment, and I just thought it might be worth a try. Um, However... Okay, the... the um, I'm trying to find a picture of pitcher plants so that people know what they're called, but I've got a mental block about what they're called. Um, no? Okay. no? I can't remember that. Somebody, somebody out there will be yelling, Steve. Yeah, I know Steve what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Steve I can, the I, I've got the Albany pitcher plant, I know. Yep. But uh, in case you're not familiar with it, pitcher plants are plants which supplement their diet with um, insects and a few other things too, the really big fellas, mm. of frogs and stuff like yes. that have been found yep. in the bottom. Uh, but they're not going to bring fruit fly under control. Uh, and the other point about them is, in our climate, when we're talking about most of the pitcher plants people grow, they really need to be in a hothouse, which is where your fruit mm. shouldn't mm. be. 
So you're, you're not going to win, but it's an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for the call. Hello. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another I question. have another question. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah. Um, I, several years ago, I bought my daughter a finger lime, and it uh, flowered beautifully this year, and she thought she was going to get fruit, but all she got was fine hair-like structures. And I was wondering why. Um, the finger lime fruit does start off very slender, mm. uh, and, and it's. Um, I'm just see if I can drag up a picture of the finger lime. Um, uh, I'm looking fairly quickly, and, and I suspect that that that's what you have, uh, and just bear with it. Yeah, you know, bear, uh, say because it's called the finger lime for very good reason because it looks like a finger. Yeah, so it is long and thin. Yep. So you might be lucky, yeah. Okay. Keep thank your you fingers crossed. Much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 That was with the worst pun. Keep your fingers crossed. Well, I didn't finger. even realise I'd done it. There you go. <laughs> Very you good, John. Keep your finger lines yep. crossed. Yes, okay. And yep. what we probably we, should have said is to eat, don't get carried away with fertiliser, no, like that's everyone's right. trying to get you to do. A little mm -hmm. bit of patience with yeah. the, um, the fruit trees. Okay, uh, we have a third caller. The calls are certainly coming in. We've oh, got wow. an eager, eager audience tonight. So, good evening. How are you? I'm well, thank you. That's good. I'm wondering if you guys can help me with my French penny. Yes. It has got, like, I'd say, cracked up the stems. Someone told me it's lack of water. Can that be true? Cracks up, cracks the, up the stem of French yep. penny. Uh, look, they're, they're very tough plants. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, they, they do, however, rot quite easily if you've got mm. physical damage. And this is what's happened to this... Frangipani, there you can see it's sort of that stem instead of being nice and firm is is rotting away, uh, and you can over the water them that will induce this. You can physically damage them. In fact, most people, in my experience anyway, over water their frangipanis yes. because yep. they're tough as. Uh, and this late rains not helping. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly. Of course, they should the look like this. That's rather than, rather than yeah, <laughs> and probably yeah. probably irregular growth rates. Yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of the problems people then they. They get impatient and they start putting fertilisers on and, and if you have irregular growth, you can start causing cracks. Yeah, but, thing, uh, yeah. yeah frangipanis, uh, stick them in a pot, stick them in the garden and ignore them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's what happens with this one. It's in a um, cottage garden, mm -hmm. but it hasn't got plants right up at the base of it. Yes. But it's just got these sort of cracks going up the trunk of it. Well, look, I, I, without seeing it, then yeah. I, I think I, I'd probably run out of suggestions. Yeah, I... I... Uh, yeah, I... Um, if you have the option, send us a picture. That would be nice. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your call. I'm sorry we can't give a positive answer. No, on that's that. right. I know we've got lots of calls. Oh, yeah. so that's, <laughs> that's exactly. There's a queue out there. Exactly. Somebody yes. should set up a tea and cake stall outside the yeah. garden. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Welcome yep. to the program. Yeah, hello there, John. So I've got a pineapple plants, mm -hmm. and uh, two of them fruited this year. Oh, great. And uh, one's got three pumps, pups on it, and the other one's got 12. Wow. Would you, would you separate the, the 12 of them? Well, look, I'm going to hand that question <laughs> directly to our pineapple, <laughs> pineapple expert. <grower. laughs> yeah, um, basically, you just need to allow enough room and... And I've got so many friends that want pineapples, I'm constantly dividing mine anyway. So, yep. um, interesting enough, I've got pineapples around my swimming pool. You, know, yep. you want a nice strap leaf plant, nice sort of... Uh, oh, nice, nice, nice until you fall into it. It's yeah. not a friendly plant. <laughs> no, yeah, but uh, actually I shouldn't say this, but there's, there's, there's varieties that don't have the prickly edge yeah. that really you shouldn't be growing, but they're more than easy to grow mm. if you take a top off it. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, at the moment, the snails are getting into them yep. uh, because of the wetter weather, and uh, they're looking yeah, a little I bit... Yeah, I don't have that problem with the snails at the moment. And they're probably but... looking a little bit discoloured because of the coolness. Yeah, they're not they're, they're, they're looking for a bit of warmth at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's, but don't that's worry true. about that. Don't get carried away and fertilise because that's not what they're looking for. They're just looking for warmth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you would separate some of them. 
I'd, I'd separate them yep. to places where you like. And probably leave it another month or so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah until they're like growing that. a bit more actively. Yep. They're yep. just coming out of, not dormancy, but coming out of a very slow growth period now. Yeah, and of course, if you have pineapples, they're taking forever to, to, oh, they do. to ripen. Yeah. So I've got about six sitting there, nearly there, but they're just yeah. not getting in that heat to make it sweet, yeah. make it worth yeah. Uh, yeah. harvesting. So probably give it another couple of months and, yeah, see how you go. Very, mm. very productive. All right, then. Yep. Mm. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. Thanks. Good luck with that. Yep. that we, we're enough. unfortunate with our climate, aren't we? We can grow oh, yeah. just about anything yeah, you know, from I'll, the tropical yep. back down. Yep. Talking I've now. actually got mine up against warm brickwork or, yes, or yes. limestone retaining walls, so they, they actually maintain that warmth in wintertime, which yeah. allows them to fruit in winter. Absolutely. Mm. No, yeah, that's, yeah, that's so. exactly right. You obviously don't have a dog that digs a hole <laughs> in the garden there in wintertime. No. The best spot to warm themselves in winter. No, yeah, no, no, on no. top of the bay. We've got a very <laughs> pampered pooch that gets <laughs> spoiled rot like mine. We're yeah. thinking being outside would be a, be yeah, a shocking. That's right. And probably it's pineapples. Yeah, right. Exactly. We, okay, uh, we have the, the next caller eagerly waiting. Good evening, caller. How are you? Hello, welcome to the program. Yeah, how's the old mate? I, uh, We're going are well. Gary? Yeah, nope. I've got some uh, tomato plants in the aquaponics set up out here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've got some uh, black spot on them. Black spot? On the leaves on the uh, tomato plants, tomato, they get the black spot on them. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering uh, what, what you can put on them or how to fix it without putting chemicals because I've got fish in me tank. Yeah, fish is exactly right. Yep. Yeah, this is, yeah, um, <laughs> this is, I guess, one of the limitations of an aquaponic system, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You are closely linked to Unless the vegetables got a and the fish. Phonics. Yes, well, I was just about to introduce the subject of alternate thinking, yep. uh, Gary Ponix, yep. and, and it's named after Gary. Gary. <laughs> mm, yeah. So, so the, what's Gary Ponix? The Gary Ponix is this idea that one of the things about the, um, the growing the food with the fish uh, waste was that you could never treat your plants because your fish are too susceptible. So I actually take the water out of the fish feed the plant in a separate location in soil and then just put fresh water in to replace what I would normally have put on the garden bed. So you, I've separated that issue. I actually got a picture of Gary's system here um, and, and you might like to explain yeah. it. Well, it doesn't look, first of all, it doesn't look like aquaponics at all, does no, it? No, it was very early in the piece too and that's well yeah, and fully overgrown now. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so your fish are in... Sorry, say that again? Yeah, my setup's a bit more elaborate than that, mate. Uh, a bit bigger, more fish. I've got uh, 20 barramundi in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, still, still the same principle yes. can apply, uh, yep. just the quantities go up, of course. So, so essentially, you're still using water efficiently, um, but instead of recycling it through your veggies to strip the nutrients in the system, you put it on the uh, on the veggies in the garden, yep. and then put fresh water in the system. So, so pretty the, much the same. Six so of the, one, half a dozen of the so other. So that doesn't help your problem because really you can't use any of the fungicides on your tomatoes, and I guess about the only thing you could do is nip the the leaves that are affected. Yeah, I would, uh, uh, try to slow the problem down because you're not going to stop it. Once no, it you're not going to stop it. But at, at this time of the year, again, you, you're starting to see a lot of these problems. So mm. I'd be uh, I'd be trying to just push them through until we get some regular fine weather, mm. and that might might start helping them. But yeah, you, you simply just can't treat them. You know, aquaponics yep. system. And I, interesting in that uh, this year, and here we are um, into October, and I mean mm. we've had an incredibly wet, a very welcome wet mm. September, I might add. But we are getting some problems throwing up that we haven't seen in a long time, uh, about ten years, I think, since we last had a good wet September. Yeah, maybe longer. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, we can't be a great deal of help no. uh, to you directly, I'm afraid, but to others who are thinking, consider Gary Ponix, the alternative. Yep. Okay, yep. Um, and I guess we have lots more calls. We certainly we? do, we certainly yeah. do. <laughs> look, at the, look at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Busy show uh, good evening. Okay. Uh, yes, welcome to Beyond Gardens Live. Hello, how are you going? Good, how are you? I've got some roses. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me, um, sure, can I fertilise them? Uh, yes. And now with the new flush of growth on them is a time to start giving them a little bit of trace elements. I wouldn't get too heavy with the um, fertilising because the aphids are still around and you, you start to encourage a lot of unwanted um, 
vegetative growth. Um, but if you just give them a light feed, uh, just to strengthen them up a bit, get them going, uh, ready for the warmer weather, but you don't want to put on that, a lot of that artificial growth. Mm. So, uh, people, do tend to, people do tend to overfeed their roses. Uh, and in fact, if you look at some of the recommended rates on oh, some of the containers, yeah. you can understand why, because um, quite honestly, the rates are horrific. Yep. And that certainly would not be helping our river yep. at all. Um, so ease back on the amount that you give. Um, yep. I still prefer a slow or controlled release yeah. product. Absolutely. Um, and, um, and that's all you need. Now, having said that, I've got roses that have not really seen any fertiliser for many years. Yeah. Um, they look all right. I wouldn't claim they'll win prizes, mm. okay, but they look all right. Um, and the only nutrients they've received is nutrients that have come out of the mulch that yep. I apply on a regular basis. Yep. Um, it's surprising yep. uh, how they can get away with it. Yeah, roses was, are remarkably tough. Oh, they are. They're super tough plants. I was just about to say the old roses that we had at our house, uh, our first house, uh, they used to get the, the prunings put straight through the mulcher mm. and back under the plants back and then again. maybe yep. a supplement of uh, trace elements. Yep. So that's, that, that's one of the things we regularly talk about at our workshops is that this story of pruning your roses and throwing the material away uh, because you're worried about black spot is a nonsense. It's not not true. And if you actually put it through a mulcher and put it back in on the ground around the drip line of the rose and allow it to re-break down, you don't have to fertilise your lawn, uh, fertilise your roses again. Mm. So mm. you can cut back. And the last one is a lot of shows are now pushing, will be pushing potash. Just ignore it. Uh, yeah. Controlled release. With all the well, trace elements. Well, a balanced product is what yeah. you want. Well, you want a balanced it? product. Don't yeah. start getting into this silly habit that the Eastern State has tried to push. Well, it's interesting, though, because potash has come about. The history mm. of it is mm. that there was uh, a reason before. blood and bone was so widely yes. adopted and animal manure so widely adopted, and these are basically lacking in potash. So people started to add potash to make up for yes. that deficiency. But now they're treating potash on its own. Yeah. And if you add potash and the plant doesn't require it, you actually create problems, um, <laughs> yes. particularly with the fruit trees. If you've got a fruit tree that's showing signs of um, growth at the top, suffering in particular, uh, what you've done is induced a phosphorus deficiency because yeah. you've chucked too much potash out. So yeah. just be careful. Yeah. And, be and careful. phosphorus is so important to the root system. So as we come into summer, we want a nice vigorous root system to help us through that summer. Okay. I yeah. thought I'd show you a picture of a rose just to put you in a good, good frame of mind. Yeah. This, is, this is what a good rose looks like. Is it there? Do we have it? Yeah, look yeah. at that. Wow. That's a rose. That's a monster. That's a rose, right. Mine's nearly as big. Yeah. And that's Rosa Banksia. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. and mm. mine has received no fertiliser whatsoever in its life. There you go. Mm. There you go. It's I'll achievable. The, uh, the stuff I got from the uh, yellow... Bo yellow uh, uh, stuff you buy from the hardware in in a yellow bottle. That's the uh, spray you spray in the rose, so it keeps the apices away. Can I spray the stuff on the um, uh, on the plant? Uh, uh, I probably wouldn't even be worried about spraying no. plants. No, I wouldn't particularly bother. Particularly your um, the no. roses. Um, look, so roses are are tough. Don't feel you have to mollycoddle them. Um, they are tough. No, occasionally they do have problems, but they're tough enough to go most of the time on their own. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think they found a rose at um, Strawberry Farm down in Albany. Um, mm. It was about 130 years later they found it out the back, still yep. growing. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that will help you with your rose questions. Uh, we'd like to thank all your calls and emails. Uh, we'll be right back. Thanks for watching.